It was, first of all, roughly equivalent. Maybe someone will be watching this videotape 40 or 50 years from now, and this will already have happened, that a group of reporters has now traveled to the moon with the President of the United States, uh, you know, hit a couple of golf shots on the moon, turn around and come back again. That was roughly what it felt like in 1972 to go to China with Richard Nixon. Uh, since the end of, shortly after the end of the Second World War, since 1948, when Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist forces were driven out of, uh, of China uh, to Taiwan uh, and Formosa, um, basically the United States and China had been in the most incredible Cold War, much colder even than the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, Americans almost never got into China. We knew little or nothing of what was going on inside China. And when we finally got to land in China in, in uh, February, I think, of 1972, it was as though we had just landed on the moon. Uh, and the Chinese were very, very selective about what they permitted us to see. First of all, you have to understand there were about 110 reporters and television and radio technicians along on this trip. It had been the subject of excruciating negotiations between the, uh, the State Department, the White House, and the Chinese government. They really didn't want that many reporters. Richard Nixon did. This was going to be his very big moment. And in terms of foreign policy, it was. It was huge. And he wanted to be sure that every moment of it was recorded. So the Chinese did. Uh, they borrowed from their Russian colleagues, and they created numerous Potemkin villages for us. For example, when the president's motorcade passed through, uh, passed through uh, Tiananmen Square for the first time, uh, what struck me was that none of the Chinese who were out there, and there were crowds there, even looked up. They were totally underwhelmed. The fact that the President of the United States, with his big limousine and the stars and stripes flying from the fender, with a huge tail of other cars and buses with the press on board, were passing through Tiananmen Square, you would think that somebody would have looked up. Nobody did. It wasn't until years later when I was interviewing someone who had been the principal photo analyst for the CIA, and we were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, that he said, you were in, you were in China, weren't you, in 72? And I said, yeah. He said, did you ever notice anything strange about that crowd in Tiananmen? I said, Actually, no, except that they didn't look up. Uh, but basically, we just whisked through Tiananmen Square, and I never really had a chance to examine the crowd. He said, well, if you had, you would have seen that basically it was about a 1,000 people. And they would walk in front of um, uh, this building, and then they would make a left turn, and they would walk behind the building, and they would make another left turn, and then they would come out again. It was the same crowd. He said they had 1,000 people that obviously they felt they could trust to do what they wanted them to do. And uh, that wasn't a crowd of just ordinary Chinese gathered in Tiananmen Square. That was 1,000 rent-a-cops who were just sort of walking around the building and then coming back around again. And a couple of days later, we were out at, at the Ming Tombs and uh, I knew enough about China. By then, I had covered China from a distance, from Hong Kong. Uh, and there were people uh, by the score out there at the Ming tombs with cameras, with tape recorders, uh, families taking pictures of each other, picnicking, thermos flasks full of hot tea, uh, sandwiches. And I thought, this makes no sense whatsoever. It's February. It is colder than hell here. 
And there is no reason at all why these Chinese families would be out there in any way. They've all got radios and cameras and tape recorders even. Chinese families don't have cameras. They can't afford to buy tape recorders. So I secreted my crew away behind one of the Ming statues and deliberately missed the bus. And no sooner had the American press left than trucks pulled up and all the picnickers loaded aboard the trucks. Guys came around, collected the cameras, collected the, uh, the tape recorders, you know, collected uh, the radios. And uh, the folks were taken back once they came. Uh, Kissinger told me the next day that after my piece ran, Joe and Lai came to him and apologized and said uh, that it was outrageous that someone had done this and it had been without his knowledge. I mean, that's why being able to get a little story like that mm -hmm. just to show that they had created this Potemkin village uh, was actually beating the system about as, about as much as I was able to do. Essentially, the Chinese had a little, uh, I mean, they had a menu for us every morning. You could go to the Korean-China Friendship Commune. You could go to, I mean, they gave you a list of three or four options. You could go to one of those four. You could not just take a camera crew. I mean, we tried uh, and got stopped and sent back to the hotel. You couldn't just take a camera crew and go out. And as for the people who were with us, they were terrified to say anything other than the sort of stock Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought cliches that had been drummed into them. And that was the case. I came back a year later to do a, a documentary. Uh, my old friend Steve Bell and I spent 10 weeks uh, in China the following year. And it was the same kind of thing. Uh, except that my, my uh, interpreter and I became very good friends. And uh, that friendship became obvious. I mean, they could see that he and I got along extremely well, and, and we laughed and joked together. And he and his wife and son were sent to what was called a May 7th re-education camp for a year after I left. I had tried to get in touch with him and uh, wasn't able to reach him. Uh, my letters were returned unopened, uh, and it wasn't until about three or four years later that he called me from Canada, and he had finally been sent on a mission uh, and was allowed to talk to me again.